As I mentioned, we're continuing our sermon series on the fruits of the Spirit. And I want to lovingly remind you again that they are not fruits that we are desperately grasping for that are so far and so high above us that we cannot reach, that the Spirit of God already dwells within us, and that our task is to uncover those fruits within us. Time and living and pain and suffering covers them up. And so today you are invited to uncover the fruit, the spirit of gentleness. Listen to the gospel reading found in Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jarius, came and, when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James, who wrote those eloquent words about wisdom we heard earlier. Now when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion and people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And at this, they were overcome with amazement. And Jesus said, feed her. She's hungry. This ends the reading of God's word. May God be praised. Perhaps you've heard the story about the sun and the wind. At one point, they had a dispute. Which of the two was the most powerful? The wind said, do you pretend to compare with me? Do I not tear up the tallest trees by its roots? Do I not level palaces and towers in the dust? Do not I raise the ocean to combustion, swell the billows of ships into the size of mountains, and send whole fleets with all their crews to a watery grave? I grant, replied the sun, these are formidable powers, but they do not equal mine. For I open the buds and the flowers to make glad the heart of humans. I cause the grass to grow, 
Everything that you see through the whole world that possesses either vegetable or animal life owes its health and its prosperity to me. Where my life-giving influence withdrawn, they would all perish. So the disputants continued, and they were in the height of their bickering and their argument when a traveler came along the road. He was wearing a large cloak, and it was wrapped about his shoulders, and his path lay across a vast plain where there was no tree or home or shelter for, that, for him as he journeyed. The sun and the wind both agreed to settle their dispute by a trial on this traveler. Which of them could first make him part with his cloak? The wind began with a terrible puff that tore away at the traveler's cloak from one of his arms and was near carrying it a mile from him when the traveler reached out and grabbed it and brought it back in and wrapped it around. The heavens were now entirely darkened with clouds and the day turned into night and the wind ravaged so that if the traveler had had a companion instead of being alone, they could not have heard each other speak. He could scarcely keep his feet on the ground, putting one foot in front of the other. He almost thought he must lie down on the ground to preserve himself from the violence of the storm. The wind, besides, called to his assistance the rain and the hail and the thunder. I do not know whether that was quite fair. The traveler had a terrible time of it. But for all the wind could do, he only hugged his cloak the closer around him. It was now the sun's turn to try. He gently burst out with rays, and the clouds were scattered in a moment. Everything was refreshed. The flowers seemed to smile. The beasts returned to their pasture, and their soft droppings from a few scattered blushes, brushes were in inextricably agreeable. The drops glittered in the sunshine. But as the sun, however, was determined to do his utmost, he made his beams gradually hotter and hotter till the traveler, who was at first exhilarated with his brightness, began to pant and sweat with the surliness of the season. He loosened some of his buttons to relieve himself and threw his cloak wide open. But last, at last, those gentle rays got stronger and warmer. He could bear it no longer, and he cast it from him upon the ground. And he sat down, and he tried to cool himself. And the sun was the definite victor in this contest. Learn from this, said the sun to his blustering companion that soft and gentle means will often accomplish what force and fury may in vain try to effect. I don't know about you, but out of all the fruits, all the fruits we have been hearing about this summer, gentleness seems the most impossible foolhardy, unrealistic, impossible. The human race, it appears, is not gentle. We push our agendas, we force our opinions, we ram others' sinfulness down their throats, we stake our claim, we claim our territory, we make ourselves bigger and louder so we can be seen and heard and valued. In this dog-eat-dog -dog world, we would get eaten alive. In this fast-paced, get things done, get things right, because God, I hope I'm right, because if I'm not, then what happens? Get what we want while we can. It's about survival. It's about being all that we can be. It's about not losing. It's about winning. There is no room for gentleness. There is no time for gentleness. But I 
I have seen gentleness. And the places I have seen it, interestingly enough, are usually at the beginning and at the end of life. The gentleness with which we hold a newborn babe, how fragile, how precious. And the gentleness with which a husband lovingly places an apron around her neck and feeds her, for the stroke has left her unable. For the way I have witnessed when a loved one dies, how the family gently cleans the body, gently holds the body. I have seen gentleness. Is there room in between birth and death for gentleness? Now, I could wax eloquently on and on about what gentleness is and what gentleness is not. There are plenty of pithy quotes and parables that talk about the merits of gentleness. But I'm not going to. I am going to bring your attention to the scripture. And what I think we are being invited to consider, there is room for gentleness. Yes, there is room. We read about how a leader of the synagogue, one in high esteem, falls at Jesus' feet, asking for help with a dying daughter. And Jesus is on his way when suddenly someone interrupts. A woman comes along and believes so much and longs so much to be healed that she touches his cloak and she is healed. And Jesus senses something, and he stops, and he says, who touched me? And the disciples make fun of him. All of these people crowding in on you, there must have been thousands of people touching him. But Jesus stops. He takes the time, and he turns around, and he looks. I imagine always when Jesus asked the question, who touched me, I always imagined him being rather frustrated. Who touched me? I'm on my way to heal someone's important daughter. But that couldn't have been how it was. Because a woman who had been in hiding for years would never have fallen at his feet with such anger and such countenance. I see in this passage Jesus gently asking, Who touched me? And she fell at his feet, and she said, It is I. And then, here's where it hits home. She told him her story. And he listened. What if we were to understand that what gentleness simply means is to allow room for another? Gentleness simply means to allow space for another. That we don't fill that space with our fears, that we don't fill our space with the shoulds and the rights, that within that space there is humility. Within that space there is safety. Where someone could feel safe enough to share their story. What if we were to simply say that gentleness is creating space 
for another who is sacred as you, who is as broken as you, who is as marvelously made as you. The Greek word for gentleness also translates meek, mild, causing no harm. Being gentle, we have been told, means that we are weak and we are vulnerable. And yet, to be gentle means that we can stay centered and grounded in God's love for us and know that there's room enough for God to love the other. So perhaps our view, our ability to be gentle, has to do with how we view other human beings. Are they, as John Calvin suggested, merely worms, retrobates, sinful, dirty, bad, wrong? Or again, I ask you, do you view other humans as created in the image of God on their own unique journey, full of their own wisdom, yearning to be discovered, just creating that safe space where they can begin to open, begin to grow, begin to flourish into who God intends them to be, not we. The soul, Richard Rohr says, needs living space, needs living models to grow. And quite precisely, we need people with the expansive energies of love. People who are eager to love change us at the deeper levels. They alone seem able to open the field of both mind and heart at the same time. When we are in this state, this state of being loved, and that is what it is, we find ourselves open to directions or possibilities we would never allow or imagine before. A gesture of love is anything we can do that helps others discover their humanity. Any act, we, when we turn to one another, and open our hearts, extend ourselves, listen, quiet. It has been said that all of the world's ills would be solved if we could be gentle with one another. This week's news has ripped me apart. I don't know about you. Ugh. Presbyterians have been a presence in Palestine and Israel for two centuries. One of the missions that flourished was when Palestine women and Israeli women came. And they came together week after week and shared their stories. That was it. Week after week, one by one, they came and shared their stories. There are varying opinions on all sides as to who is right and who is wrong. And as our church continues to face the fact that we are seeking to be open to a variety of people. There are people who will line up in sides and say what is right and what is wrong. But what a difference it will make if we can be gentle with each other. If we can allow others their personal bubble there's space, and a space we provide where there is peace and safety. And they are free to grow and to discover their own truth for themselves 
and they are free to be loved. Because as Matt mentioned at the very beginning of this whole thing, it is all about love. I want to close with a poem, but first remind you that we will fail at being gentle. We will make mistakes. Part of writing this sermon was for me to um, repent. <laughs> I have not always been a gentle parent. <sighs> we will have hemorrhages. We will have wounds that we will want to keep to ourselves. We will be broken. But we believe in a God who says the words, Come and lean on me. I am gentle and meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. This poem is written by Jan Richards, and she talks about how the story of this 12-year-old girl who died and was raised, and this woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years became interspersed because Jesus allowed the room. I know how long you have been waiting for your story to take a different turn, how far you have gone in search of what will mend you and make you whole. I bear no remedy, no cure, no miracle for the easing of your pain. But I know the medicine that lives in a story that has been broken open. I know the healing that comes in ceasing to hide ourselves away with fingers clutched around the fragments we think we are ours alone. See how they fit together, these shards that we have each been carrying, how piece to piece they make a way we could not find alone. Do you have room for gentleness? For yourself, for others, for God, for the world. I invite you now in a bit of silence to see what gentleness God might be inviting you to on this day. <laughs> 